Okay, thank you. It's a pleasure to talk here today. Um, I'm going to, let's see, are my, can you bring up my view graphs? Yeah, just keep them up. Um, so I'm going to, uh, to start out spending a little bit of time talking about the uh, work of the NSTC Committee on STEM Education, looking across uh, STEM education across the federal government. And then I'm going to really concentrate my remarks on switching hats to, to a science education researcher and talk about a, a scientific approach to STEM education and try and convince you of the value of taking this kind of rigorous measurement-based approach to both understand the design principles and then use that to, to achieve much more effective results. And I want to mention that as soon as I, oh, there's the laser pointer. Uh, oh, well. Um, I want to mention that most of my results, that I, the examples I'm going to give you are from physics and at the college level courses. But that's just because we have the best and most, most extensive data there. There's lots of other research I could show you that shows how these ideas really apply to all levels and all STEM subjects. So uh, just briefly, the NSTC Committee on STEM Education was created uh, or authorized uh, this last January with the American Competes reauthorization. And um, I co-chaired this with uh, Subra Suresh. And this committee has launched really two main activities. We have task forces uh, looking, carrying out an inventory, looking in, in great detail at what is actually being done across the federal government in the area of STEM education. And then a, a second, uh, more expansive effort is to really lay out a strategic plan for the entire federal STEM education efforts. And uh, so that's, of course, a, a big effort, but we're hoping to complete that by early next year. The STEM inventory effort is um, moving along much more rapidly. And I want to say a little about this compared to the previous efforts, because this is something that's been done repeatedly. But I hope we're going to be providing something new and, and in some ways more useful to this. Uh, we've been working quite closely with the agencies to have uh, clear, def consistent definitions of kind of the unit of analysis of a, of a STEM program or activity. In the past, those were quite variable consistent definitions of what it really means to have a STEM education program. Um, and then we're collecting much more details about the program, who and why they're serving, what they're trying to do, and so on. And so at the end, uh, across the federal government, different agencies will be able to see where there are similar programs they can align with and, and build on, and so on. Um, and so we have actually are in the process of collecting data um, we have uh, it almost done when we get a few stragglers in who don't have their data, mostly from NIH and a few from ONR. Uh, uh, we'll actually be, have that finished and we'll be able to uh, then write up our report. Um, one of the things we're discovering is there are an enormous number of these, close to 300 is actually emerging. But the dollars are probably less than people have thought in the past, in part because we real, we decided, you know, the Merchant Marine Academy, which was listed as STEM education and past things, were taking off the table, and so that's reducing numbers. Um, okay, so I want to move on to then uh, my the central topic today, which is really looking at how to improve STEM education. Uh, with this group, I don't need to spend any more time belaboring why this is so important to the country and to our security, and of course, why that's made it a, these are the reasons it's a presidential priority. Um, but I want to argue that these, what these reasons mean, what we need to try and achieve, is really to have all students, regardless of what they're going to be doing, to think about and use STEM more like STEM professionals, scientists, and engineers. And that's really kind of the metric that I'm going to be using when I look at the research in this uh, area. Now, I actually came into this uh, a long time ago 
and thinking about it like a science, really from the perspective of working with my physics graduate students and trying to understand the puzzle of why excellence of many years of, uh, in physics courses did not translate into competence in doing physics research, but that after a couple of years in the lab, there'd be these dramatic transformations and people were experts. And after I'd observed this enough time, I, I got curious enough, I really started tackling this like a science problem, and that meant I went off and looked at what was the research on how people learn and how people like they learn science. And actually, I then got started into doing those kind of experiments and research myself. And so, you know, I'm going to, the rest of my talk is really going to share insights that have come out of that process uh, over the past 15 years I've been involved in this. And the most important message is that there are, been important advances in the last one to two decades in three quite different areas of research. The cognitive psychologists studying how people think and learn, uh, people studying in detail and making great strides in understanding the brain and how it functions, and then research in the science classroom, particularly the college science classroom. And advances from all of these different areas are really coming together uh, to give a very consistent, coherent picture, actually, of what's important for achieving learning, particularly in learning complex expertise, like in math and science. And the bottom line, really, which I'll start with, is really it's, it's given us a, a whole new paradigm for thinking about teaching and learning of these things. The, the old paradigm is really the, the idea that in our classrooms, uh, you know, we have coming in these brains and they're all different and pretty much fixed. And we immerse them in some knowledge, doesn't have to be a classroom, any educational experience. We immerse them in knowledge and basically it soaks in the variable amounts depending on the condition that brain started out as. The, the new paradigm that this research really uh, supports is that in fact, the brains are quite changeable. And so they come into our classrooms. Um, whoops, this is crazy on me. They come into our classrooms not really all that different. And to the extent they undergo the same kind of mental exercise, they transform and develop in quite similar ways. And it's really that brain development and growth, growing new neurons, new Neur uh, connections and so on, which is, is involved in learning complex expertise. So the sort of bottom, you know, important message here in one, when one's thinking about educational activities is, uh, you know, to paraphrase Kennedy is, you shouldn't be asking, what do I want to explain or show or tell the learner? You should be asking, what is the mental processes that I want to stimulate to go on in their brain? And that's what uh, really counts. And so the rest of my talk is really going to support this idea. And I want to start looking in more detail about, OK, what can we say about what are the, the mental processes that are important? And you know, what's involved in thinking like an expert, a scientist or engineer? And this is a place where cognitive psychology has done a lot of recent research in looking at what makes up expertise. And it's very interesting that as they study this across a wide range of activities, they find there's certain very consistent features about what makes up expertise and how expertise is developed in, in everyone. So the first component of of being an expert in something is not surprising at all. It's experts in their subject have a great deal of factual knowledge about that subject. The others aren't so obvious, though. It turns out that within any given uh, discipline, uh, the experts have a, a unique and, and specific to that discipline way of 
framing or organizing all that information they have. And, it, and that organizational framework is such that they, it makes it very effective for them to retrieve and apply that information at suitable times to solve problems. And these kind of organizational frameworks involve you know, recognizing certain complex patterns and associations and relationships. And much of what we talk about of scientific concepts is actually uh, the way scientists in a field organize a whole lot of different pieces of information into one chunk that then when faced with a problem, they can bring, bring up that information and use it. Now, the third key element of expertise is an ability to monitor one's own thinking and learning in the, in the discipline. And so an expert in solving a problem is continually asking themselves, you know, is, do I understand this? Is this a sensible way to be solving this problem? And they can call on resources that actually answer that question and, and allow them to realize they should be changing direction as appropriate. Now, these elements of expertise, particularly the last two, the, the studies show that these are fundamentally new ways of thinking, and nobody comes into a field actually having that competence, and that everyone, and this is what the research shows over and over again, everyone requires many hours, in fact, it's many thousands of hours to reach a high level of expertise, of practice in thinking and practicing uh, like an expert. And it's becoming increasingly clear, one can actually go and do brain imaging now to see that this process, and I think it's now pretty clear it takes so much time and intense effort because it's basically biology, that this process is really changing the wiring of the brain. And so the the model that seems to work quite well is that what's really happening is the brain is really developing in response to this intense exercise, very analogous to the way a muscle responds and grows in resp uh, when it's used strenuously. So what, is, what kind of exercise is really key and again, there's some very consistent general features to this. Um, one has to spend these thousands of hours working on you know, challenging but doable tasks and questions and problems. And they need to both be highly intense. They demand to, for learning to take place. It's uh, this kind of deep learning. It, it requires full, intense focus. And it also, they need to require quite explicitly carrying out these different aspects that make up expert thinking. And so some kind of generic ones um, that apply in pretty much all STEM disciplines are having a, a set of concepts and analogies, mental models that experts use in a field, having the ways experts use to test whether those, which of those apply and don't apply in particular situations, um, having very complex pattern recognition systems that pick out key underlying features that tell you what's relevant, irrelevant for solving problems in the area, and then these ideas of self-checking and reflection on your learning and correcting what you're doing. And what, the te and what a, a effective teacher really needs to be doing is, is understanding what expertise in the subject is and designing these appropriate tasks, appropriate levels, appropriate components. Um, but then also pr providing two other absolutely essential elements. Uh, one is motivation. People will not learn, people will not put in intense mental effort unless they see a good reason to do that. Teachers have a lot of impact on that. And then also the teacher really has to give effective feedback and guidance to shape thinking. And those are all uh, key elements in this process of learning. Okay, go back, sorry. Why was this not? Uh, yeah, so the, the 
I mean, all these things I listed don't involve any knowledge, but I want to make the point that knowledge is absolutely essential. Any one of these components in any given topic or discipline is really only makes sense embedded in the knowledge and, and information of the field. And so one has to be using learning knowledge, but it's in thinking about these underlying mental processes, that knowledge is really embedded in the context of the problem and the process being used, and that's really make what makes it useful knowledge as opposed to uh, sort of disembodied facts. So that was a quick overview of some sort of underlying cognitive psychology aspects. I want to now show you that this really does work when you put these ideas into the classroom or and I'd argue any educational experience, but um, we have particularly good data from college science classrooms. And I'll start with uh, an area that's been studied quite a lot in physics, which is really conceptual mastery. And that really means being able to think about and use uh, concepts and to solve problems in novel situations. And one example of where this has been studied a lot is looking at basic concepts of force and motion that are covered in every first semester physics course. And in the process of studying how people learn these, they've developed some, some carefully crafted and tested examinations that uh, see how well students are mastering this, usually by giving them some novel real world situation and see how they can uh, use these concepts. And so the force concept inventory is one of the oldest and most widely used of these. And it's now used quite extensively in introductory physics courses. Uh, and it's used by first giving it to all the students just before they've started the course to see what they know and don't know. And then giving it the end of the course to see what things they didn't know at the beginning do they get right at the end. And so it's a very direct measure of what they actually learned from the course. And we have data now from hundreds of courses like this every year. And it, this test shows a remarkable result, which is that if you look at this, this fraction learned, you average over all the students in, the, in a class. Um, for the traditional lecture approach, which is, of course, used in the overwhelming way we teach science and engineering in this country, um, the average student never learns as much as 30% of these key concepts that they didn't know at the start of the class. And this is just a histogram showing, that's been published, showing 16 uh, data from 16 different courses, uh, example of this. But the thing that's so striking about this is this, this limit is really independent of the quality of the lecture, the class size, the institution. There's Harvard University and two-year community colleges in, this, in the data I'm showing you here. Um, and we've got similar examples from other levels in physics and other sciences. And it, and it really prove, provides a, a very compelling picture that the standard lecture approach is simply not effective at developing this kind of conceptual mastery. But driven by these results, uh, researchers have found different, better ways that I'll show in a minute uh, to teach this material that now pretty routinely one can just pick up and use and get uh, numbers up in the green region, typically a factor of two improvement in learning, which is really a pretty dramatic gain. Um, here's a good example of that. Uh, this is. Uh, some work done at Cal Poly where they used one of these conceptual mastery tests, quite similar to what I just mentioned. They collected data on this for many years. They had many instructors in many sections, and they always came out with an average of just below 0.3, just consistent with the other data I was just showing you for this fraction learned. And then they put in place this change teaching approach. And this was really a an approach where they had a set of activities all the students do, and the, the instructors were really there just to, uh, not just to, but to, to facilitate the students working through these activities in class. And what they then saw was that basically across all of their instructors, all these different sections, the learning gains doubled, and 
within the, just the random statistical noise of small numbers, uh, all the sections, all the instructors are essentially doing just as well. And it really shows you that the, well, and I just have to point out this one instructor who improved a factor, of, the students learned a factor of six more when they switched uh, to this different teaching approach, sort of about as dramatic as you can get. But this really makes my, my basic point, which is it's, the, it's the really the mental activities of the student, what's going on in their brain that are really dominating the learning of expertise. Uh, just give you a couple of other quick examples of this. Uh, this is work I was involved in, um, peripherally, um, doing a careful comparison um, between a good traditional t teacher um, and use of research-based practices. This was done in, a, in two very large sections of physics for engineering students and it was very carefully controlled. So it kept it exactly the same topics and learning objectives in exactly the same time. And then the students were tested on this on a test that was jointly developed by the two instructors. The two instructors were this one who, one who was very experienced, highly rated by the students, but got, gave basically pretty traditional lectures. And then a, quite an inexperienced instructor, but was trained in the program I ran in these kind of research-based uh, teaching methods. And the results on, the, on then this common test of these two groups, which had been measured very extensively before this intervention to be completely identical, um, you know, the results kind of speak for themselves, that there's a dramatic improvement in the, in the learning for these research-based methods. And it's, you know, it clearly works for the entire uh, student population. There's almost nobody in the standard lecture class that would have been even scored average in the other course. Um, and the attendance and, most importantly, the engagement of the students were way up. Uh, I would have been horrified. Uh, well, it would have been astonished if the engagement hadn't been way up because, as I said before, we know that uh, this real true learning requires intense engagement. Uh, just to show you, it's not all physics. Uh, here's another very recent uh, article from science, published in Science Magazine uh, in a large introductory biology course. And they, again, introduced m many of just the same kind of teaching practices. And again, they saw that all the students improved. But this work was particularly notable in that they focused, looking carefully at the effect on underrepresented at-risk students, ethnic minorities, uh, the low socioeconomic class and low parental income, all students that traditionally have really struggled to succeed in STEM in, in college. And they saw that these teaching methods benefited that group a disproportionately large amount. In fact, it's about moved up the average for them about a third of a letter grade, which is really a, a big shift compared to the when everybody's moving up, they're moving up more. OK, so hopefully you're convinced that this kind of uh, thinking about education and, and teaching is it works better. I figure I better show you what it actually looks like in practice. Some of you know, some of you may not. So I'm going to give an example of, of how this would look uh, in teaching this way to a large class, you know, 200 some students, uh, particularly with some technology to enhance uh, the effectiveness of the instructor. And so this would be teaching an introductory sub course on uh, that covers current and voltage. And so the students would start out by having a, a pre-class assignment. They'd have to read the, the particular section in the textbook that covered this material, and then they'd have, right shortly before class, a brief online quiz that uh, tests them on that. And then the class is really not based upon the instructor transmitting information, but rather the students carrying out a series of tasks and problems, as I talked about before. Uh, and so, for example, class would start with uh, this question. You know, you've got this circuit. You close the switch. What's going to happen to the brightness of that one light bulb? Uh, every student in the class has what we call a clicker. It's a device 
looks a lot like this, and they have to look at this question. They basically uh, push the button that they think is the right answer, and the re computer records who they were and what answer they chose. Now, this, this activity is really just primes them for the real learning that then comes next. So before they know the answer, um, all the students in the class are part of consensus groups of each adjacent two or three students, and they then have to talk to each other about which answers are right, and, or what answers are right and what are wrong, and what the reasons for those being right or wrong are. And while they're doing those discussions, the instructor's busy wandering around, listening in on those conversations, and so getting a much better picture of exactly what the student thinking is and what they're understanding and not understanding. And that then helps lead a, them lead a, a whole class discussion where, in fact, the students then give their reasoning to, and share the whole class. And by, because the instructors listen in, they can make sure and bring out both the, all the correct and incorrect um, thinking that the students have, and so it can be sort of undisplayed and examined by the class as a whole. And then finally, when we get around to uh, actually showing the results from the histogram, and, and then even better than go on to do the experiment. Now, I'm not actually going to, in this class, I didn't do the experiment, and, and today I'm, I'm going to use some other technology um, that, and I'll talk about why that's useful. Unfortunately, I don't have a computer up here, so this is going to be a little awkward. Can you alt, do Alt-Tab now uh, to bring up the simulation? Cir one more over circuit construction kit. The Java, oh, there you go. So since I didn't have a computer, I just threw this together to display, but um, you can see I left out one light bulb. Uh, but the students are shown this. Okay, can you connect those two wires together? Okay, great. So you can see uh, you know, what happens here. You can change the voltage and the electrons move faster and the bulb gets brighter and so on. Uh, the reason I want to particularly display this is it's just an example. This is another project I s got started on developing these interactive simulations. They're an example of how w proper use of technology with, uh, can actually build in many of the important design principles for effective learning that uh, that one knows, particularly if you actually then test with the students and refine and change things to make sure they actually accomplish those design principles. Okay, can you all tab back to my talk? Should bring it back. There you go. Um, okay, so, so that's about halfway through the coverage of this because when you're teaching like this, then this stimulates many follow-up questions from the students where they extend these ideas into new contexts and, and situations. They test their mental models and so on. And so this would typically be followed by five or 10 minutes of follow-up discussion. Now, one doesn't just have clicker questions like this. There are other, a variety of small group tasks um, that do the same thing. And this would be an example as a follow-up to that unit where you know, the students would be then told, OK, you've learned about that with light bulbs. Now, can you explain, come up with reasons and why if a person plugs a heater in a dorm room and they see the lights dim, why that might be happening and what that might tell you about the wiring in the room. And they just have to write that down. So, you know, I hope you can see that the, the students are really spending all their time in class being very engaged, solving problems, thinking, through, you know, having to do expert thinking, developing mental models, testing if those are right, testing their reasoning and so on. But, the instructor is not just sitting there back doing nothing. In fact, the, when we study this, the instructors are often talking about half the time, but they're never doing this as a, you know, a talking textbook transmitter of information. It's always reactive, responding to student question and thinking, and, they, and thereby, in real time, guiding that thinking, which makes it much more effective use of their time, much more effective use of the student's time in terms of actual learning 
But I do have to put out the warning that what we've seen is because the, there are many much deeper questions come out of the students, this actually requires considerably more subject expertise by an instructor than following the traditional lecture mode. Okay, so I'm just gonna finish up here with a, with a, a checklist that really, you know, if I, as I have done a rather extensive review of the literature, uh, the research literature on this, coming up with some key elements that I think are, you know, if you're developing an educational activity, you, ought to, you need to go through and make sure that it, it addresses each of these because they're all critically important for learning. Um, first, does it appropriately connect with the, the learner's prior thinking and knowledge? Uh, does it motivate them to want to learn the subject? As I say, that's absolutely essential and has to be a key part of any educational activity. Um, does it take into account what we know about memory and not overloading their working memory and, and having the characteristics that we know facilitate long-term retention, which basically means they've got to have retrieval and application spaced out in time about the material? Um, does it ensure this practicing of the kind of expert thinking you want them to learn? And that really, you, you know, I, I can't stress enough how that requires a very careful analysis of really how experts think and solve problems in the subject, including, you know, quite open-ended, innovative type solutions. When we've put that into practicing, those students dramatically improve in, in the kind of how innovative they can be in solving problems. Uh, is effective feedback provided? And coupling to the previous talk, are you really measuring the learning that matters? Are you really thinking about your, your metrics, your tests, are really probing how well they're learning to think like an expert? Because most of the tests and things we use, actually, to a normal student in a classroom, you do better if you actually use quite non-expert approaches. And I could say more about that if you want. But um, so, I mean, each of these, I could give an hour-long talk on the details of research that goes into any one of these and how to do it effectively, but I don't have time today. So uh, I'll just finish with, you know, I, I hope I've given you some hint and, and possibly convinced you somewhat that this scientific approach to thinking about STEM education can get, tell us a great deal about how to improve what we do and can make great advances when these ideas are, are properly implemented. And if you want to learn some more about this, here are some of, a few of my favorite references. There's a nice book from the National Academy on how people learn, uh, a couple of other, uh, another book and a shorter article by me, and then some references, uh, a website that actually gives a lot of resources and references on this kind of uh, research that I talked about here. And there's the interactive simulation I use and lots of others on other areas of science are available for free at that website. So thank you. <laughs>